As James Smith pointed out last uh, Sabbath, uh, a very good sermon, by the way, uh, we do live, live in increasingly uh, uncertain and uh, obviously troubled times. And, uh, you know, we could go on and on about that. But despite that ominous fact, um, the reality is that most of us live in a very privileged society. And I'm talking to God's people around the earth that are part of Pacific. We live in a very privileged society. In fact, if you're a student of history, you will know that most of us live better than the kings uh, in, in past centuries and past millennia ever lived. As an example, uh, the Roman Empire in their heyday, around the time of Christ, uh, who walked this earth, and, and despite all of the advances in the culture and, and all of that, uh, only 50% of uh, the children that were born at that time reached the age of 10. Only 50%. And of, of those who survived, the 50% that survived, they only lived to be, on average, 45 to 50 years old. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that that are fairly obvious, sanitation being one of them. But the fact is that uh, the current life expectancy in the United States, uh, even though it's dropped a couple of years because of COVID, uh, is about 79 years old, men and women combined. In Canada, it's 82. In Australia, it's 83. And when you think about that, and then you think about the fact that we have cooled homes with air conditioning in the summer, and we have heated homes with central heat in the winter that past generations never even dreamed of, much less, much less had. And uh, when the sun goes down at night, uh, we can walk into a room and throw a switch and uh, have light. And uh, that was hard to come by 100, 200 years and beyond. And we don't have to go out and either gather or kill our food before every meal. We have food in this thing called a refrigerator in our home that's powered by electricity. And we open the door and lo and behold, there's food for us. And we have an oven in our homes uh, to cook this food with. We don't have to go out and gather firewood to either build a fire to cook our food or build a fire to try to get some heat in the middle of the winter. We don't have to do that. And we have clean drinking water, which we take totally for granted. Not only do we have clean drinking water, we have it from an indoor faucet. All we have to do is turn a knob and we have clean drinking water. We don't have to walk miles to get drinking water as many, many millions of people have to do today in certain parts of the earth. Plus, we have hot water for bathing, and we can shower or take a bath uh, at, at our discretion. And there are some days I've taken two or three showers a day. And the fact is that in the past, that just didn't occur. Uh, King Louis IX bathed twice in his life. And Queen Isabella of Spain was bathed on the day she was born, and she bathed the day she got married. And that was it. And back in, in, in those dark ages, as we call them, people just didn't bathe. In fact, in, in China and Japan, that was different. But uh, certainly in Europe, bathing was viewed as a, uh, a health risk. That's how ignorant we were back then. You know, we can travel halfway around the world uh, in the time it took a king to travel 40 or 50 miles uh, 500 years ago. And we have all of these blessings. We live in a free society today. Of course, we can come and go as we wish, uh, despite the fact that those freedoms are being uh, restricted more and more. But the fact is, that we don't have to show somebody some papers. We can go and come as we wish. 
And the list of these blessings goes on and on and on when you think about it. And this is all despite the fact that our father, uh, as, as James pointed out, is allowing Satan to take our country and to take the world down at an increasingly faster pace. But the fact is, we have so much to be thankful for. We really have so much to be thankful for. And yet, in these latter days, when we have so much to be thankful for, we're told that mankind is going to be just the opposite, unthankful. Let's go to the very familiar scripture, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. And Paul is talking about the last days. And for a time, Paul thought that he was in the last days, but uh, came to understand that that wasn't the case. And now, you know, roughly 2,000 years later, we are indeed right up into the last days. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1. Know this also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. Indeed they are. But notice in verse 2, the first thing that Paul says to describe this, uh, perilous times, they will be, men will be lovers of their own selves. And then the very next uh, word he uses is covetousness, or covetous, wanting more for the self. Then he goes on to mention you know, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. And then we come to this word, unthankful in the last days. Despite these incredible blessings, despite all of the things that we have, uh, they, are not, they are taken for granted and not appreciated. And we see unthankfulness around us all the time. You can't turn on a news program without somebody showing uh, some news item about somebody or some group protesting. Placards marching up and down the street, yelling and screaming, their eyeballs popping out, their veins popping out. They're so upset about it. The fact is they are protesting because they are demanding something that they don't have, and yet they want. And I'm not saying all protests are, are not legitimate. I'm not saying that at all. But the fact is people are focusing on what they do not have rather than the blessings that we do have. Mark Twain, who is one of my favorite writers, he, he was an American writer, and, and obviously he was a humorist, and he was a publisher and a lecturer. He was born in 1835, and he died in 1910. He said this about this situation, quote, If you pick up a starving dog and make him prosperous, he will not bite you. This is the principal difference between a dog and a man. Now think about that. Why would a man bite the hand that feeds him? Because man always wants more. Man is never satisfied. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 5 and read verse 10. Uh, Solomon is writing for our benefit giving us the lessons that he's learned, some of them very painful, the lessons he learned in his life. I'm going to read this out of the NIV. Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10. Solomon writes, I, li I like the way the NIV translates this, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This, too, is meaningless. And we know that humans like Satan always want to get more, are never satisfied with what they have. And thankfulness to their Creator for His blessings does not even occur to most human beings today. Because increasingly, uh, people do not even believe there is a Creator who gives blessings. And our Father, as our Creator, wants to give His children blessings. He wants to give to His kids. 
Let's go to James 1 and verse 17 and see a, a truism, a principle about the character of God our Father and obviously his son Jesus Christ who shares the same nature. James 1 and verse 17. James, the half-brother of Christ, says this. James 1, verse 17. I'll read this out of the King James, and uh, it'll be so unless otherwise noted. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from, and, and who is the originator of the blessings, every good and perfect gift? The Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He does not change. And because of our Father's giving nature, He wants to give to us. Because of His giving nature, He also wants us to be thankful for the gifts that we have, the gifts that He gives us. He wants to be thankful for what we have been given and not focus on what we do not have, but to focus on the gifts He has already given us. I ran across a, uh, an interesting Hasidic uh, parable, and I think most of you are familiar with the sect of Judaism, the, the Hasidic sect, where the men wear the hats and the long uh, curls uh, in, front, uh, in their hair and dress in black and heavy coats and all of that. This is one of their parables, but it's interesting. Quote, once times were tough, two poor farmers were talking or were walking down a country lane and they met their rabbi. How is it for you? The rabbi asked the first man. The first man says, lousy. He grumbled. He bemoaned his lot and his lack. Terrible, hard, awful, not worth getting out of bed for. Life is lousy. God was eavesdropping on this conversation. God thought to himself, lousy? You think your life is lousy now, you ungrateful lout? I'll show you what lousy is. Now, this is a Hasidic parable. I'm not saying it's accurate, but it's, it's, it, it makes a point. Then the rabbi turned to the second man, and you, my friend... Ah, he says, Rabbi, life is good. God is so generous. Each morning I get up when I'm awake, I'm so grateful for the gift of another day of life. For I know rain or shine, it will unfold in wonder and blessings too bountiful to count. Life is so good, he said. The parable goes on. God smiled as the second man's thanksgiving soared upward. Good, God said, you think your life is good now? I'll show you what good is. So we see here that this parable has a contrast of looking at life from two different perspectives. One is a thankful spirit, and one focuses on everything that's going wrong or what one does not have. Now, with that contrast in mind, let's go to Ephesians chapter 5, and we'll begin in verse 1. Because Paul addresses this, but keep this contrast in mind about how we can view really the same thing, and yet come away with two different viewpoints, two different opinions. Ephesians 5, verse 1, Paul says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us, and here we don't deserve this, but Christ loved us, gave himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Verse 3, because of this, he's saying, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, or not suitable, or appropriate. But notice he says, but rather, the end of verse 16, giving of thanks. Verse 17, go to verse 17 now. 
Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Okay, what is his will? Don't be drunk with wine, wherein is it excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. But notice verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks always for all things, because even in a trial, there can be a benefit. We can learn something. Giving thanks always for all things. And that leads to our title today, Focus on Being Thankful. In this very unthankful world, we need to focus on being thankful. And we're going to look at this subject through five different points. The first, uh, and this is the, the foundation of it all, is that true thanksgiving has to come from our heart, from our innermost being. It can't be just lip service. True thanksgiving must come from the heart. Notice Psalm 69 and verse 30. David is writing this, this psalm. Psalm 69 and verse 30. But he makes a very important point about thanksgiving, uh, whether it be from the heart or just out of routine. Psalm 69 and verse 30. In his day, thanksgiving was in many ways expressed by a sacrifice, by an offering. Psalm 69, verse 30, David says, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving, he says. Verse 31, this also shall please Jehovah better than an ox or a bullock that has horns and hooves. And why is that? Well, back then you could sacrifice an animal and your heart would not be thankful. You're just doing it out of duty or doing it because you don't want the wrath of God to come down on you. So you sacrifice an animal as kind of an insurance policy, but you, you're not thankful from the heart. There's no inner thankfulness. Now, with that in mind, let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 29, and we're going to begin in verse 10. 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 10, where uh, this is a, re a record, this is David's final recorded prayer that was written down for our benefit today. He's ending his life. Solomon, his son, will, is, is king, is going to build the temple. David had been uh, assembling uh, money and, and uh, materials to build the temple, for which she was very thankful for. First Chronicles 29, verse 10. Wherefore David blessed Jehovah before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be you, Jehovah, God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Notice his attitude. Yours, O Yehovah, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Yehovah. You are exalted as head above all. Notice where he's coming from. Everything belongs to God. Verse 12, both riches and honor come from you. You reign over all, and in your hand is power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Verse 13, Now therefore we thank you and praise your glorious name. His name is Yehovah. We praise your name, but we thank you. Verse 14, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of you, 
and of your own have we given you. We're just giving back to, what you, back to you what you've already given us, he says. Verse 17 now. I know also, my God, that you try the heart. You test us. And you have pleasure in uprightness when we're righteous. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now have I seen the joy of your people, which are present here, to offer willingly unto you. Verse 18, O Yehovah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, that is God Almighty, the Most High God, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of your people and prepare their heart unto you. So he's asking God to keep this thankfulness, this joy of giving for the temple in the imagination of their heart going forward. Because Israel needed that help. And while David was indeed thankful from the heart, Israel was not. Because David had the Holy Spirit in him, we know that. We also know Israel did not have the Holy Spirit. They did not have uh, a heart that resembled uh, the nature and character of God Almighty. We won't turn there, but you remember in Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, Yehovah lamented that, Oh, I wish there was a heart in them, referring to Israel, that they would fear me and keep my commandments always. Israel didn't have that heart. David was asking that they could keep this joyous heart of giving uh, that they had at that moment in time. Israel didn't have a godly heart, and they did not keep that spirit and that attitude for very long. Now let's go to Romans 1 and verse 18 and see what uh, Paul has to say about having a thankful heart. Romans 1 and verse 18. Paul is, is giving, some, giving us some very important eternal truths here in this section of Scripture. I'll read this out of the NLT. Romans 1, verse 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth in their wickedness. And we have seen people suppress the truth. We've seen it in the church. We see it out of the church. They did it in Christ's day by opposing him. Verse 19, they know the truth about God because he's made it obvious to them. Verse 21, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God. Now notice this, or even give him thanks. Because if you acknowledge God as our, as our creator, our father is our creator, then we're in a position of giving him thanks for what he has created. But if you don't acknowledge God as creator, you don't have to give anybody thanks. And that's our world today. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. And today, Satan is turning our world into a secular world, a godless world, a godless society. And the belief in a supreme being is at an all-time low these days. And what Paul is telling us, and this is a fundamental fact that we need to always keep in mind, is when humans fail to acknowledge their Creator, when they fail to acknowledge God Almighty as their Creator, they fail to acknowledge even their Creator's existence, their heart becomes darkened and confused, as Paul just wrote. So true thankfulness has to come from the heart, from our innermost being. Not a show, not a demonstration, but coming from the heart. Now that leads us to a second uh, point in focusing on thankfulness, is Christ set the example of thanking His Father. He set us the example. Let's look, go to Luke chapter 10 and begin in verse 21. 
Luke 10 and verse 21. Uh, we're uh, breaking into the account where Christ sent out the 70, you remember, and they went out and they performed miracles and healed the sick and they came back and reported with great joy uh, of what uh, the Father had done, what the whole, through the Holy Spirit had done when they went out and he sent them out. And so Luke 10 verse 21, Christ is rejoicing. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes, these 70 that he sent out as an example. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. So the point here is in verse 21, Christ openly said, Father, I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the work that you're doing. And he was grateful for that. Now let's go to a second example in John chapter 11. And we'll begin in verse 39. John chapter 11 and verse 39. We're breaking into the account of, of the death of Lazarus. He, is, he has just died. In fact, he's been dead four days. And uh, Christ is on the scene now. And there's, everyone is uh, upset. Uh, Martha particularly uh, is upset about the death of Lazarus. John 11, verse 39, Christ said, Take away the stone, Martha. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, He says, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said unto her in verse 40, Didn't I say unto you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God, if you'll just believe? And they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, now he's addressing his father, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I knew that you hear me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you've sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. In the beginning of verse 44, he that was dead came forth. So here are two examples of Christ thanking his Father, and obviously there are many other examples of Christ expressing thankfulness toward his Father, and he is in that way setting an example for us. And that comes to the third point, and we'll spend more time on this point than any other, because the third point is about us today. That for us today, giving of thanks should be a daily occurrence. It should be a daily occurrence. We should not let a day go by without being thankful to our Father. We just shouldn't. And if you'd like to outline uh, point A under this, is we need to be thankful in our daily prayers. With that in mind, let's go to Daniel 6, and we'll begin in verse 9. Um, we're breaking into the account where Darius, uh, King Darius, had signed a decree that no one could ask anything from any god except they ask King Darius, who was presenting himself as their god. And they couldn't do it for a period of 30 days, and that was signed into law as an attempt to uh, trip up Daniel. Daniel 6, verse 9, Wherefore King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day. And that is, you know, we, for, for decades the church has taught it's a good thing if you can to pray three times a day. And he prayed, but notice what his prayer was about. 
and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. And so the, the character of his prayer, the only mention of, of what the content of his prayer was, was thankfulness. Three times a day to be thankful. And he gave thanks while his life was in danger for doing that very thing, praying to God Almighty. And of course, uh, he paid a price for that, but our Father rescued him. And Paul continues that same theme in Colossians 4 and verse 2. Uh, we won't, no need to turn there. It's, it's just such a short verse, Colossians 4 and verse 2. Paul says, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Continue in prayer with thanksgiving. Daniel set the example. Paul mentions it again. So point A is we need to be thankful in our daily prayers. Point B, a second way we should show thankfulness daily, is that thankfulness, we need to be thankful for our everyday blessings. Because every day we have blessings. Every time we throw the light switch, it's a blessing. Every time we turn the air conditioning on and it works, it's a blessing. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. Paul is instructing the church in Thessalonica about being thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. Paul says, in everything, give thanks. That means large things, small things. Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It is God's will that we give him thanks for what he has given each one of us. And... Paul even demonstrates that in his personal conduct. Let's go to Acts 28 and, uh, and read verse 15. It's just a small example of the fact that, follow, that Paul followed his own advice. Luke records Paul setting this example. And he is arriving uh, in the area of Rome, but notice what he did. Acts 28, verse 15, And from there, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as the Appy Forum and the three taverns, and whom, when Paul saw, what did he do? He thanked God and took courage. Paul was thankful for the simple fact that the brethren would come, would come out to meet him. He was thankful for that, and he thanked God for that. And, of course, we need to be thankful for our daily meals, our daily food. Christ set the example of that. Remember the 4,000 men plus women and children in Matthew 15? He uh, asked a blessing on the food. The 5,000 in uh, John chapter 8 or John chapter 6, he did exactly the same thing. And, of course, uh, he thanked God for the bread and the wine that we take on Passover evening. And we have, a, uh, have it recorded that uh, Paul was on a voyage by ship from Jerusalem to Italy. And there were 276 people aboard. They were going to shipwreck later. But they had a fast and they broke the fast. And before they ate, Paul asked a blessing on the food for those 276 people. So there are examples of asking uh, blessings throughout the Bible on our, for our daily food. And we need to just be, you know, be thankful for the everyday things. Uh, I can remember once, um, you know, when we owned our own business, I traveled a lot, and I can remember coming back from, from uh, Canada, uh, Vancouver, Canada, and it was probably 1 in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, and I was going through Ellensburg, and for those of you who don't understand Ellensburg, there's a long hill that you pull up going south toward our home in Yakima. Uh, in the east coast, you would call it a mountain, but it's really out here in the west, it's a hill. And, uh, uh, but it's about 1,000 feet above the valley floor. 
And I was, I was the only person on the road, just the only one. There was no, no lights in sight. And I looked out to the north, and I saw the, the aurora borealis. And we, don't, we get to see it occasionally here, but not all that often. And here it is, I don't know, it's 1.32 in the morning, and I just pulled off to the side of the freeway, shut the car down, shut the lights off, and just leaned up against the fender and, and looked for about, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. I was tired, but, you know, how, how often do you get a chance to see this? And these shimmering curtains of, of uh, turquoise and blue and green, and you just sit there and marvel and say, God, how, you know, how marvelous are you? And thank you for allowing me to even see some of your creation like this. And it makes an impression. And, and we need to be thankful for these everyday blessings that we have. Uh, the third point C is we need to be, now we're getting into some more serious things to be thankful for. We need to be thankful for our calling. The thankful, thankful that God reached down and called us. And when you think about the billions of people that have ever lived and how many he's actually called, and we're here today to worship him on the Sabbath because of that calling, how thankful should we be? Look at Colossians 1 and verse 12. Paul is encouraging the people in the church at Colossae, and of course us today, he's encouraging us to be thankful for that calling and where that calling leads. Colossians 1, verse 12. Always thanking the Father who has enabled you to do what? Share the inheritance that belongs to God's holy people who live in the light. Thankful to God Almighty to share this inheritance. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear Son. How thankful on a daily basis should we be for that. And look at chapter 2 now, Colossians 2 and verse 6. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. Colossians 2 verse 6, And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. Verse 7 out of the King James, Rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein. You see, we've been called to this faith. We've been called to this belief. And so we should abound therein with thanksgiving for this calling that we have. Where would we be without our calling? I mean, we'd be lost. We'd have no hope without our calling. And that's something we should be thankful for every day. Point D, the fourth, is we need to be thankful for the church. That our Father even created the church, bearing His name, placed His Son at its head. How thankful should we be that we have a church? to go to, to fellowship in. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. This is, Paul is introducing this epistle, and so he's speaking on behalf of, of Paul and Silvanus and Timothy. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. And... Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, notice, we give thanks to God always for you all. Thanks for the church. Thanks for the brethren in the church, making mention of you in our prayers. And then notice uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. He continues the same uh, thought process, the same example. I'll read this out of the NLT. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. He says, 
Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received his message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is, and this word continues to work in you who believe. And we know that we're called in one body, and we're told to be thankful. That's Colossians 3 and verse 14. Don't need to turn there. But we're called into one body, and we need to be thankful for that body and for that calling. And we are so blessed here to have a local church because so many brethren don't. You know, they're, all of you out there that are listening or watching right now or will do so, the vast majority of you uh, are by yourselves or with one or two or three people. And here we have a whole room full of people to fellowship with. And how thankful should we be for that? And how thankful that all of us here should be that we can have a Sabbath service and stream it uh, for the benefit of God's people. Now, point E, we need to be thankful on the Sabbath especially. And here we are, worshiping God Almighty on the Sabbath. Let's go to one uh, verse, Psalm 92 and verse 1, the very beginning of Psalm 92, because David tells us, uh, it's a good thing to give thanks on the Sabbath day. In fact, Psalm 92 and verse 1, if you have a heading before that psalm starts, it's, it's in most translations, it says a psalm or a song for the Sabbath day. Psalm 92 verse 1, It is a good thing to give thanks unto Yehovah and to sing praises unto your name, Yehovah, O Most High. He is the Most High. He is the Almighty. His name is Yehovah. And the Sabbath is a special day to give our thanks to Him for His many, many blessings. Okay, point F. This is the last sub-point under we need to be thankful for uh, everyday things daily things. This one is the most important. Thankfulness for who our Father is and who His Son is. Thankfulness for who they are. And we need to thank God every day for who He is and who His Son is. Notice Psalm 30 and verse 4. We're in Psalm 92, just back to chapter 30 and verse 4. Psalm 30 and verse 4. This was a psalm that was sung at the dedication of the completion of David's house. But notice the, the tenor of this song, psalm as it starts off. Psalm 30, verse 4. We're told, Sing to Yehovah, O you saints of His. And that's who we are. But notice what it says. And give thanks at the remembrance of of His holiness. Give thanks because He is holy. That is who He is. And how thankful we should be for that. And we should be thankful that the, 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 the Father and His Son don't change. We've already read that earlier. We won't turn there, but Malachi 3 and verse 6, uh, Yehovah says, I am Yehovah, I change not. He says, Malachi 3 and verse 6. And then uh, in Hebrews 3 and verse, uh, 13 and verse 8, we won't turn there either, but you can use it as a reference. We're told that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and is the same today and will be the same uh, forever. So how thankful should we be that the Father and His Son don't change and their plan of salvation doesn't change? How would it be to worship a God that wakes up one morning and says, Oh, whoa, Ten Commandments, all done away with. Uh, I've got a new plan. Or I want you to do this or that or something else. 
And the father and his son reassure us that what they said in the beginning, and what they said when these words were written, and what they say to us uh, through the Holy Spirit does not change. Now let's go to 1 John 4 and verse 18. 1 John 4 and verse 18. Talking about who God is and who His Son is. 1 John 4, verse 8. And this is, defines our Father in many ways. He that loves not knows not God, John says, for God is love. Now to verse 16. We have known and believed the love that God has to us. He repeats it again. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. I took the time to look up the word is here when it says God is love. That's Strong's 1510. And it's the Greek word I me. And it mean, it's spelled E-I-M-I, -I, pronounced I, me. And it means I exist, I am. Now that's really interesting. So if you look at, at, at helps word studies and what they have to say about it, they say this about I, me. Quote, the basic Greek verb which expresses being, that is, to be. In other words, who he is. Going on, help says, the I am, the Greek me is ego I me, the I am harks back to God's only name, Yehovah, meaning he who always was, is, and will be. You know, it's amazing that... that uh, the researchers who did HELP's word study understand even from a New, pers New Testament perspective the name of God Almighty and how this ties in when we say God is love. And so we should be forever thankful that love is our Father's defining characteristic. It's not harshness. It's not retribution. It's not vengeance. Love is his defining characteristic. And his son has the same nature. They are together in their nature. And so, therefore, this is their defining characteristic. And he and his son never change. Now, how thankful should we be for that? Now we go to the fourth point. Thankfulness has many scientifically proven benefits, being thankful. Um, CNN reported uh, here recently uh, about the subject of thankfulness. In part of their, their report, they interviewed a teacher and a doctoral, doctrinal student at the University of Michigan in neuroscience and psychology. Her name was Christina Costa, and she does research of all things, on thankfulness. And uh, uh, that, this pricked my interest. And she said, they were interviewing her, and she says, you can see thankfulness on a brain scan. Can you imagine? And she said, feelings of thankfulness light up the feel-good part of our brain. It, in other words, it, it increases the neurotransmitters of dopamine and serotonin and uh, decrease the stress hormones of cortisol. So when you're, when you're being thankful, you're revving up your feel-good hormones and you're diminishing the stress hormones. She says, quote, the neurotransmitter reactions are pretty immediate. It's hard to feel bad when you're focusing on someone that you are so grateful for someone you're grateful for, or something that changed your life, or something that is going really, really well today. Well, doesn't our Father and His Son fit all three categories of that? 
someone you're grateful for, someone who's changed your life, and someone is making your life go well today, and it lights up that part of the brain, and they can actually see it in a scan. And what thankfulness does, uh, they, they have found, the same uh, research group found, is it increases your immune, immune system's uh, strength and health if you're thankful. This uh, researcher Costa said, quote, studies have shown that thankfulness can indirectly influence physical health as well. Thankfulness strengthens your immune system and helps you experience less pain by being thankful. And in another study, uh, they found that thankful teens were less likely to use drugs or alcohol. This is a study of New York teenagers, and they got the, the group of teenagers together, and they rated them on, on a scale of being thankful. Uh, who were the most thankful and who were the least thankful? And they found, then they examined their lives and their conduct, and they found that the ones who were most thankful were less likely to abuse drugs, less likely to abuse alcohol because of their thankfulness. Thankfulness also allows us to sleep better. Uh, there was another study done uh, involving college students, and they were uh, told to try to be thankful and to try to find ways to enhance your thankfulness. And uh, they suggested uh, uh, using a uh, gratitude journal that at the end of each day you would write down what happened good that day and what you should be thankful for. And they found out that those who participated in, in writing it down or thinking about it before bedtime, they were less worried at bedtime. These are college students, less worried at bedtime. And those who were thankful slept longer and slept more deeply and slept better by being thankful. In another study of adults in the United Kingdom, they studied a group of adults, 40% of whom had sleep disorders. They, were, they just had problems, sleeping was problematic for them. And so before bed, they were trained uh, by these researchers to think about what they should be thankful for and what they were thankful for. And uh, after a period of instruction, then they measured their sleep before and after the instruction and those that were thankful fell asleep sooner and they stayed asleep longer by thinking about uh, what they should be thankful for before they went to sleep. Also, studies have shown that thankfulness increases our resilience, including our ability to cope with stress, our ability to cope with trauma, you know, some disaster in our life. Studies have shown that counting our blessings, and I know that's a kind of a cliche, counting your blessings, but studies have shown that people who do count their blessings, acknowledge their blessings, fare better because they've used that technique to help Vietnam War veterans manage their PTSD by getting them to focus on the blessings they have rather than the trauma that they endured in the past. And they also use that t technique for 9-11 uh, survivors. And it's a coping strategy for the trauma that they endured uh, by focusing on being thankful and what they should be thankful for. Also, studies have shown that thankfulness helps in a marriage. In a study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, uh, five researchers wrote a paper and they concluded that couples good at exhibiting thankfulness to each other, thanking each other for what they did or what they do for one another, tend to be more committed in their marriage and more likely to remain married for a longer period of time if they establish the habit of expressing thanks one to another on a daily basis. So ending this fourth point about how thankfulness has health benefits. Our Father designed our bodies in such a way, I think it's very clear that He designed our bodies in such a way that when we have a thankful spirit or we have a thankful attitude, our health benefits as a result. 
Why would God do otherwise? If he wants us to be thankful, why would he curse us for being thankful? But he encourages us to be thankful, and he says, by the way, if you'll do that, your health will benefit. You'll sleep better. You'll have less stress. Uh, you, you know, you can cope with life's traumas better if you will just be thankful. Okay, now we come to the fifth and final point, is that thankfulness leads to contentment and peace. When we are thankful, we are more contented and we are more peaceful. And uh, I can tell you from a uh, personal experience that is absolutely true. If we focus on, uh, on what we have been given and how blessed we are, uh, we have a sense of peace and, and a sense of, of contentment that we otherwise would not have. Let's go to Hebrews 13 and verse 5. And the, the author of Hebrews states a very fundamental fact. Hebrews 13 and verse 5 I'll read this out of the New King James. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. And we talked about that in the introduction, how in the last days people will be covetous. But let your conduct be without covetousness, but notice this, be content with such things as you have. And we're such a blessed society, we could spend hours talking about the things that we have. From hot and cold running water to heat and air conditioning to transportation to a soft bed at night to uh, not being uh, driven out of our homes and put in jail and, and you know all of those things. Be content with the things you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And Yehovah has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He said it in Deuteronomy. He said it in Joshua. He said it in Isaiah. Be content with what we have. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8. Paul says the same thing. Uh, a bit more specifically. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8. Paul gives us some good advice. He's advising young Timothy, uh, a newly minted elder and uh, less experienced than Paul. He's giving him some advice, some advice in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8. He says, having food and raiment, food and clothing, let us be therewith be content. And the fact is, if we examine our lives, we have basically everything we really need. We have food, we have clothing, we have shelter, we have warmth, we have cooling, we have, we're, we're not you know, worried about where the next meal is coming from. Uh, we have peace, we have safety. Uh, we have so many blessings. We have everything we really need. And yet man wants to focus, well, I want a better house, or I want a better car, or I want, I want to wear these clothes, or I want that handbag, or those pair of shoes. I just can't exist without the next, you know, whatever it is that people lust for. You see, if we are truly, con uh, truly thankful for what we have, we'll be content. It'll be just fine. Notice Philippians 4 and verse 6. Philippians 4 and verse 6. I'm going to read this out of the NLT. This is a great translation. Uh, in preparing a sermon, I try to look at other translations. But boy, this one is, every once in a while, one just, just you know, hits home. For Philippians 4 and verse 6. I'll read this out of the New Living Translation. It says, Paul's writing, don't worry about anything. Pretty cool. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Going on, tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Tell Him what you need. 
but thank him for what he's already done. Now, this is from a man who was beaten with rods three times, three times shipwrecked, once stoned and left for dead. And he's saying, don't worry about anything. Be thankful for what you have. Be thankful for what God has done. And if Paul can do that, so can we. And so should we. Okay, now let's, let's uh, summarize and conclude here. You know, we've, we, we've heard the analogy, you know, about the glass being half full or half empty, and, and depends on how you view that half full glass or half empty glass. Well, if our glass is half empty, what we're doing is focusing on uh, the part of the water that's missing. In other words, we're focusing on what we don't have. But if our glass is half full, we're focusing on the fact that we got a half full glass of water, and that's a good thing. We're not focusing on the, on the part that's not full. And so we have to ask ourselves, you know, in the grand scheme of things, as we live our daily life, what do we have going for us right now that's really good? We have family. We have friends. We have love in our life. We have health. We have freedom from war and freedom from natural disaster. We have a church. We know who God is and who His Son is. We have a roof over our heads. We have hope. We have opportunities. And we also have memories that we cherish. We have relative financial stability. I mean, nobody's, uh, you know, billionaires around here, but we have enough for our needs. We have our favorite places that we like to go to or remember. Uh, we have good weather. We have books. We have music. We have ice cream. We have something good that happened today. And we have something bad that didn't happen today. And we have a good cup of coffee in the morning. So life is good if we focus on what is good. Uh, I think you've heard of Tecumseh. He was a Shawnee warrior and chief. He was born in 1768 and he died in 1813. And this chief said this, quote, When you arise in the morning, give thanks for the food and for the joy of living. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies only in yourself. Now think about that, because we have so much to be thankful for. Now, I said, is your glass half full or half empty? Well, for us, being called, and having the Father and His Son make their abode in us through the Holy Spirit. We have God's Word. We have the power of the Holy Spirit to lead us to salvation and to resist Satan and to resist the world. Then when we look at our glass, it, it should be overflowing. It shouldn't be half full or half empty. It should be overflowing. If we think about our calling, if we think about our future, our glass is indeed overflowing. Let's go to Psalm 118 and verse 29 and see just this one verse. <clears throat> and we have to ask ourselves, how thankful should I be for what this verse says? Psalm 118 and verse 29. <clears throat> We're told, Psalm 118, verse 29, O oh, give thanks unto Jehovah, why? For he his, is good, for his mercy endures forever. That he is a good God, a merciful God to us, his children. And then let's go to one uh, final scripture in uh, the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57. Here in Psalms, we, we're told to give thanks to Yehovah. 
And Paul tells us the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57. Paul's making this declaration. And, and this, is, this is the joy, the overflowing part. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. How thankful should we be for our glorious future, for our calling, for His Holy Spirit in us. There's a, a, an American author, his name is Adam Clark. Uh, he was born in 1943 and he died here not long ago in 2018. But he said something profound about being grateful and thankful. He said, quote, In our daily lives, we must see that it is not happiness that makes us grateful. It's not happiness that makes us grateful, but the gratefulness that makes us happy. Being grateful makes us happy. Being thankful for our Father's blessings is a blessing in and of itself. Because being thankful brings physical blessings, spiritual blessings, and benefits such as peace, contentment, and health. And so being thankful is a blessing in and of itself. And it is increasingly important in these very perilous times that we face. So going forward, let's focus on being thankful.